Thank you all for coming. The fire exit there, can you please keep the fire exit clear for health and safety reasons, please? Uh, thank you for your patience. We're going to make a start. I won't be long. My name is Councillor Kizar Hussain. I'm the election agent for Jill Oblivy, the prospective parliamentary North candidate. I would like to welcome Jeremy Corbyn uh, to be here with us. It's a great honour and pleasure to be with you, Jeremy, here today. It's always been my dream to uh, sit on the stage with you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, I'm not going to make a big speech. I'm just introducing and briefly uh, going to talk about this campaign. Um, I want to say this Bolsonaro campaign is about the people, the community, all of you here about electing and helping and supporting Jeremy Corbyn, elected Labour government in England, in Warsaw North, and we need your support, all the members, all the community activists, all the BME communities. So from my aspect, it's about community engagement today. It's about motivation. It's about all of you helping Jill, helping Jeremy get, get this victory in the lo in elections and the local elections. And for, for from our aspect, this is very, very important. Jeremy Corbyn's manifesto, Jeremy Corbyn's vision is what we believe in, is what we want, and what this country needs for the many, not the few. On that note, I'll pass it over to Jill, who's going to be our future member of parliament. I'll try not to garrote you as I go past. Um, but uh, first of all, thank you for being so patient in waiting for, for ourselves to arrive. We got a bit waylaid with the, uh, the cafe. Uh, but I'm so pleased to see so many friends, old and new, here today supporting this campaign and the vital importance of winning back Walsall North. I'm really pleased to be supported by the Labour Group leader, Sean Coughlin, and we're going to be launching a joint campaign to make sure that we also take back the power within the local yeah. authority. Yeah. Now, I'm sure that all of you are more excited to be listening to what Jeremy's going to be saying uh, than myself, but I thought I'd take the opportunity to just talk to you about who I am why I'm standing here uh, in Walsall North and what type of campaign it is that I want to run and why it's vitally important that we kick Theresa May out of government yeah. and we put a proper leader straight back in there with Jeremy. That is the most important thing. And we have a fight for the many and not for the few. I'm here today because members of the Labour Party felt that I and believe that I have what it takes to win back and lead this campaign and that together we can help to change people's lives that have been left devastated by continuous Tory austerity cuts that have ripped apart our communities and left neighbours fighting amongst neighbours to get a decent standard of living. I grew up, as you can probably tell, I'm not got a West Midlands accent, I grew up in Blackpool where many of you have probably been on a weekend trip. Um, and what I would class as a normal dysfunctional family. And why I say normal dysfunctional, because in my eyes it was normal, but in society, dysfunctional. I grew up being the only girl in a, in a family of boys. My dad was an excellent motor mechanic, being trained by Rolls Royce as an apprentice, but not a great businessman. In fact, he'd rather do favours for mates than actually earn a living. And my mother worked in a restaurant behind the bar. And not knowing any different, because a lot of my friends were the same, we all grew up living hand to mouth. And that wasn't really a problem, because everybody that I went to school with was in the same boat. But when I went to senior school, that was highlighted to me. And that's because I was coming out of my community and going into senior school. I was going into a senior school that had just converted from an all-women's grammar school to an all-women's community school. And to be quite honest, the teachers couldn't get their head around it. All the new uh, batch of kids that were coming through. And I learned very early on that it was about money. It, money was how you were perceived in society. 
and how you were treated differently. And because I didn't have money, I was treated differently. When my brothers all started to leave home, my mum and dad decided we got a big house and a big heart. So what they did was decided to foster and adopt hundreds and hundreds of children. So actually I've got a very, very large family now. Don't ask me to name them all. I couldn't do that. But it gave me an understanding of how society treats children as a whole, how we discarded our young, and how much I wanted to change that for the better. So I decided when I went to senior school that I would want to become a social worker so that I could put back into society and help those children. But when I went to see my careers advisor, as we all do, I got very looked down the nose at and said, Oh dear, why would you want to do anything like that? You're never going to amount to anything apart from working behind a bar or in a shop. Well, look at me now. Thank you very much, Mrs. Hodges. Yeah. <laughs> but when you're talking to a 14-year-old about their future life and somebody that is your peer and who you look up to tells you that you're not going to amount to much, you start believing it. And unfortunately, I did believe it. And I started rebelling. And unfortunately, I left school with very little qualifications. And in fact, actually, we were the first experiment for GCSEs. And the government deciding to change the education system at that time. And the teachers, again, didn't know what they were doing. So a lot of us left school with hardly any qualifications and felt failed. So I did. I went out, left school with my one our level pass in art, not very good really when you're working behind a bar in Blackpool, although it does help when you're doing tattoos. Uh, and that's one of the many things that I did growing up in Blackpool and working. But I drifted from job to job, a very seasonal town, and did YTS for £30 a week, giving me mum £10 to pay for my rent. Um, and then eventually I ended up working in the civil service. I went into the civil service as a fixed term appointment, a temporary job, didn't think much about it, but I remember vividly my first day. I was sat there with the manager, I was handed the official secret site, my contract of employment, and then a union application form. And the best question I've ever asked in my life is, what's a trade union? Because that's where my true education started and began. I quickly realised as a result of being in the trade union movement that I was not a failure, that I did have skills, and that I did have a voice. And I wanted to start using it. And like many trade union representatives who end up in that position, I just didn't step back quick enough when they asked for a volunteer. So I ended up being a trade union representative. And I started to learn about politics and about people's rights and how the education system was failing our children. I knew from first-hand experience, and how the decisions of government were having a devastating impact on my community, and that growing up poor was not a lifestyle choice. It was something the government was inflicting and could have done something about, but it didn't, and instead it ripped the heart out of my town and my community. It forced Blackpool to be a home, a re -home homeless families from across the UK. And that saw a downward decline in Blackpool because it became known as bedsit land. Mm -hmm. So I started to get more and more involved and then the surge of 97 began. And then we saw a political party starting to stand up and fight for what it believed in, fight for our communities and our way of life. And I began my <coughs> political campaigning. After the general election, and um, what a landslide that was, I moved, my, I moved, due to personal circumstances, to Chesterfield, where I'd met my future husband, who was an ex-miner that was still suffering, as a dev uh, suffering from the devastating impact of the mine closures. And I saw firsthand, yet again, how the Tories had ripped out the heart of communities. But instead of doing anything to help those communities, it <coughs> left them, and it left them behind, rather than investing in them. And Chesterfield is still recovering today, much like Walsall. Living and working in Chesterfield, I was also delivering the benefits system. And I have to say it, under New Labour, not everything was right. We had some good things, we had some bad things. 
But one of the things that we got really wrong was the job seekers allowance and how there was more importance on sanctions and targets than actually helping the families and help to feed them. So I became disillusioned, but I got more and more involved. I became the first female president of a trades council in Chesterfield, and I had the help and the support of some real leaders in the political movement, with Tony Benn, Harry Barnes and Dennis Skinner being my personal mentors. And I still hold those lessons close to my heart. So with these decisions that was happening, I wanted to try and make a difference, but I found I was fighting more and more against the Labour Party that I was supporting. And I became disillusioned, and I felt that my voice was not going to be heard or ever going to count. And shortly after all of this started happening, my life took another dramatic turn. And yes, it was painful at the time, but I felt it was for the better. I moved to Birmingham. And that's where I met my real family. <laughs> uh, my Birmingham family is huge. And I've never been in a community like it until I started getting to know people in Walsall North. But they took me in. They repaired the damage that had been done. And slowly and slowly I started to recover and start getting back involved in politics again. And then I started seeing a change. I started seeing hope. Hope was starting to grow within the Labour movement. Yes, we'd lost power. We were out of government. But we started seeing people saying that enough is enough. We need a change. We need a Labour Party that's going to stand up and fight for us. And I'm really pleased to say we got that. Because we got Jeremy as our leader. Whilst working for the GMB as well, when I came to work, live in Birmingham, the people in the GMB said, Jill, you've got so much more to offer. You represent your members, you go out fighting day in, day out. Why don't you take that wider? And I thought, well, my voice isn't really going to be heard, it's not going to be counted. I know things are changing, but I'm quite happy just to sit back and see what happens. And then I met Jeremy, I met John, and I met Angela. And Angela was a true inspiration because, like me, she's a northern lass. She doesn't care what anybody thinks about her accent or how she looks or what her family's like, whether she's got any qualifications. And she said to me, you can do it. It doesn't matter what anybody thinks of you. Do not care. Get on and do it. That is why I'm here today, because of those people that inspired me to stand. And that's why I decided to stand for Walsall. I saw in the 2017 election a devastating impact by the Tories getting allowed in. And I thought, how can a working class community, very similar to the two towns that I come from, end up being in this position? And I wanted to make a difference. So that's why I put myself forward. And that's why I wanted to fight for Walsall North and to make sure that we win back this seat. I want to stop the lies that the Tory MP keeps coming out with that the policing cuts are down to the policing commissioner. It's not, it's down to his Tory government. They made the decision to cut the funding for police. I wanted to stand up for the NHS. I'm not like him, like Eddie Hughes, that comes out and says that our nurses are paid enough, particularly in Walsall. How dare he say that nurses are paid enough when they've had a flat rate increase each year, every year, and suffered a pay cut. And it's about time that we made sure that he, his government stood up for education and did something about the education for our children in this, in this town. We've seen Blockswitch Academy recently make a huge amount of redundancies as a result of the government funding cuts that he backs up in Parliament. So how can he turn around and say to you, he's fighting and defending you when he's in Parliament making decisions that has a direct impact on you and your lives and makes you poorer? We've seen youth services close down as a result of his government's in, uh, imposition of funding cuts. And then they sit there and they wonder why that we've got a rise of antisocial behaviour and crime on our streets. For God's sake, our kids are bored. Give them something to do, so open up our youth services. I became the candidate of choice because I believe we have the right policies. 
and the best manifesto ever to make a real change to people's lives. And I will oppose all of what the Tories stand for and work to undo all of the damage they are inflicting on this community. I believe that my voice and everyone's voices are finally being heard, not quietly, but loudly. But we need to do more about that. We need to shout and we need to roar from the rooftops. We will not take this anymore. We will not lie down. We will not face any more austerity cuts. And we will fight back and we will succeed. But I cannot do this alone. I need everyone and it is so good to see so many of you here today. But I need everyone in this room and outside to work with me and to organise together to help win over the people of Walsall North. That's why I'm here today to ask you to work with me and my team to win this seat and to end the austerity and bring back hope to Walsall. And now thank you for the person that inspired me to become who I am today, of whom the whole country is looking towards to make those changes. Here he is, the next Prime Minister of the United Kingdom, Jeremy Corbyn. Well, the MP for Warsaw South to say a few words, and I'm going to be handing over to Valerie now. Thank you, Kizar. Thank you, everybody. Uh, and Jill, thank you very much. Uh, as most of you know, uh, I'm the Member of Parliament for Walsall South, and just I just want to say thank you to everyone who did come and work for Walsall South in the last election, just in case I've missed any of you. So that's, that's to start with. But secondly, I also want to thank, it's been a really tough day for Jeremy and, and his team. And I want to thank everyone behind the scenes, the Labour Party staff at regional office and in the leader of the opposition's office who come along with Jeremy and really made this day so far successful. And lastly, thank you to all of you for turning up in an afternoon, a sunny afternoon, uh, to hear how you can help in the next election, how you can help get that Labour government. I also want to mention Rebecca Jenkins, who's the PPC in Redditch, so there was also help needed in Redditch as well. And, Zoe and another well. one, and Zoe. <laughs> Sorry, mate. And Eleanor's here as well from, from Wolverhampton. Can you all stand up, the PPCs? And then please, and then please, and then please, and then please anybody else. else. <laughs> exactly what Jill is going to be. She is going to be an outstanding member of Parliament. The person I am going to introduce, I've known for a very long time, in fact I discovered an old photograph of me in the late 80s when Jeremy came and came across from Islington to Ealing just before I became a councillor and, and did a, a, a meeting on benefits. I think it was on the day of the FA Cup final actually, Jeremy. <laughs> But Arsenal weren't playing, so that was okay. But that's the commitment of the person that I know. Jeremy, throughout his life, has been on the side of the angels. He's been on the side of equality, justice, and hope for the future. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Jeremy Corbyn. <laughs> much all of you for being here this afternoon and I'm sorry we're a bit late starting but we had one of these problems that we do get from time to time and that is there were more people than there was space for them so we had to have another meeting outside before we came in here because I think if anyone's made the effort to come along to an event then they should at least get something from it so we did an impromptu rally outside in the park. <laughs> and so can I say thank you to everyone that's put on this event today and it's part of our campaigning all over the country 
After we've uh, completed here, we're going on to Telford to do an event there. And tomorrow we're going to Harper Adams University, then we're going to Stoke-on-Trent to campaign there. And then on Wednesday we're in Corby and Nottingham, and Thursday we're in Mansfield and all over the East Midlands. We are campaigning everywhere. And the week after that we're doing four days of campaigning in lots of marginal constituencies in Scotland. Scotland's coming back. Yeah. Yeah. So it's about getting that message across. And I want to thank a number of people that have come here today, particularly Valerie Vaz, who's a very important member of the Shadow Cabinet, absolutely brilliant Shadow Leader of the House, will be a great leader of the House, but also a very valuable colleague in everything that we do within the Shadow Cabinet. Valerie, thank you for that, and thank you for what you said today. And I'm really pleased that Eleanor Smith is here today, because she's not just a brilliant MP, but as one who grew up in the West Midlands, remembers the horrors of the racism of the 60s and 70s, when Enoch Powell was marching around the place and all that he said. The idea that his constituency is now represented by Eleanor Smith makes me very, very happy. <laughs> it's what I call real justice. <laughs> And to the other candidates that are here, Zoe, thank you for coming here today. And Becca, you have sent me the most wonderful card. Where are you? Yes, thank you. Uh, a wonderful card from Redditch Labour Party. And it goes on, keep going, we will do this, uh, starting Dear Jeremy, and says, and pretty, pretty please, come and visit us in Redditch. <laughs> Well, I can't say no to an invitation like that. So let's go to Redditch as well and all the other marginals all across the West Midlands and win there. And Mark McDonald is here from Stoke. Where are you? Oh, great. We'll, we'll be speaking with you tomorrow. Come to the front. And uh, could I also say thank you to Sean for being here today as the leader of the Labour group. And tell you what, next May, let's make sure we win it win control, have a Labour Council in Walsall. Because our campaign is about showing people things could be done very differently. Think about what's happened in this country since 2010. Wages have gone down. The number of homeless people has gone up. Hospital waiting lists have gone up. The number of people needing social care has gone up. The number of young people in terrible and deep debt for going to university has gone up. The number dropping out of education, higher and further education, is increasing all the time. The number of people sleeping rough is increasing all the time. These aren't accidents of history. These aren't accidents of economy. They're deliberate actions by a government that imposed austerity in 2010 the result of which has been falling wages, cuts in public expenditure, more and more people working longer and longer hours for proportionately less, and yes, at the other end, an explosion of the number of multimillionaires and billionaires in this country, and the investment, if you call it that, in high-end, unoccupied, speculative luxury housing in London and the South East while the rest of us look for somewhere to live. It's not sustainable, it's not acceptable, and frankly, it's immoral and morally wrong that they're allowed to continue doing it. So today, today they finally got round to saying they're gonna do something about rough sleeping and homelessness. They're gonna halve it in goodness knows how many years. And they say it's all very unfortunate. Well. It's not just unfortunate, it's quite tragic. I talk to homeless people sleeping on the streets around the country. And one of the most interesting meetings I had last year was an hour and a half in a private discussion with about 50 rough sleeping homeless people. They told me of their lives. Things had gone wrong. They'd been ill. They'd been sanctioned. They'd lost their flat. There'd been a family breakup. They thought they were doing well, and suddenly they found they were turfed out on the streets as a result of a brutal system. And instead of getting help, they got kicked out. And getting kicked out meant they had no income, they had no identity, and they had no address. 
Kelsa Prees, so many end up drugs and alcohol and further down the road as a result of that. What kind of welfare state and society is it that tolerates that degree of social exclusion for a number of people? And so, a Labour government would do things very, very differently. First off, we'd purchase 8,000 properties so that all the rough sleepers could get somewhere to live, albeit temporarily, but at least a roof over their head. Some degree of sense of security. And we'd start a house building programme to build half a million council houses during the lifetime of the first parliament of that Labour government to start to deal with the housing crisis. Because insecure, inadequate housing is bad in every single direction. You live in a private rented place, you've got no security, you've got a high rent to pay, it's a deterrent from getting a job, it's a deterrent from surviving, and it's very insecure for children who don't know where they're going to be living from one year to the next and may even have to move school as a result of that. I call it a social investment that we will invest in housing for all across the country. It will create jobs. There's a virtuous circle of benefit in investing in housing rather than speculative building for the high-end, very rich properties at the top end of the scale. I want to see that house building explosion take place all over, which is why we spent, this, we spent part of this morning at a company building houses, wooden construction houses, very good quality ones for social housing needs all across the country. And I was very pleased and proud to see them. That is what a Labour government would do so very differently to what this Tory government is doing. And then you look at our education system. You look at the way in which they've promoted academies and free schools without any sense of rationality to whether they're needed or not, or whether they should be built or not. Taking away from local authorities the power to construct their own schools and have some influence over local education. And too many children not getting the nursery place they need, and too many hungry children not learning properly because they're too hungry to learn. A Labour government would do things very differently. A free nursery place for all two to four year olds, proper funding of all our primary schools, a free school meal for every primary school child, and music and art education for all children in school. Because it is about how we treat our young people, the creativity that can be unleashed, the imagination they have, the future they need for themselves. And in the last election, when we produced our manifesto for the many, not the few, a lot of people in the um, media glitterati who know everything so well and understand everything so well said, oh, that'll never work. <laughs> Public ownership, wow, that's very unpopular. Oh, can't do that. Abolishing university fees, can't do that, can't do that, can't do that. And you know what? Our support increased throughout that election campaign. We got the biggest swing to Labour since 1945. Biggest vote for two decades almost. We increased our support because people saw in our manifesto something of themselves. They saw hope for the future, not pessimism, inequality, injustice and poverty in the future. That's the difference between us and the world. So, higher up in the age range in education, we will, of course, and university and college and adult education fees. And we'll pay for it by increasing corporate taxation in order that they contribute to the educational needs of all of us. Because it cannot be right that my generation, Valerie's generation, were given essentially totally free education at college and university level. It's not my place to take that opportunity away from another generation and to sign young people to get in the future. But it isn't just about university, it's also about vocational and skill education. I want us to have a real equality and parity of esteem between getting a degree or getting a qualification that makes you a good engineer, that makes you a good electrician, makes you a good plumber, makes you a good electronics engineer. Have some understanding of how our economy works, which is why part of this summer campaigning is about investment in industry for the future. This government has not shown much support for manufacturing industry, and indeed not much interest in it. 
And so we thought about this a great deal and we're doing a number of things. We're proposing a national investment bank and we're proposing with that regional investment banks. The national investment bank's job is to improve the basic infrastructure, transport infrastructure and broadband infrastructure of the whole country. The regional transformation funds are about investment in local industry, investment in high-end manufacturing, good quality manufacturing, imaginative jobs, but it's also about supporting enterprises in developing and growing. That is public intervention in order to promote economic and industrial development. We've gone far too far in the direction of a service-based economy away from a manufacturing-based economy. The West Midlands preeminence was always in manufacturing. We've got to invest in manufacturing for the future. And that is exactly what we're doing. Other countries do it exactly the same and benefit as a result of it. So we will be doing that. And insisting that there are sustainable development plans that local authorities buy locally wherever they can and promote cooperatives and promote good quality local employment. So we'll take the shackles off local government and what it can do in purchasing and helping to regenerate the economy. We're very serious about this and so we're having economic conferences all around the country at a urban and town and regional level. There's going to be one here in Walsall later in the year, there's going to be one in Stoke-on-Trent and there's going to be one in Telford. We're very keen to make sure that that discussion takes place about how we collectively look at our local economy, look at our skill levels and look at what we could do better and achieve together. Take the manifesto of 2017 as the benchmark and develop it from there because that is what our party and our movement is all about. The idea that somehow or other the market knows best and leave it to the private sector will always work, surely anyone who still believes that must be living in some kind of dream world. Have they never travelled on Northern Rail? <laughs> Have they never seen the, the now second collapse of a franchise on East Coast Main Line? Have they never seen the rip-off? Profits made by water companies that have asset stripped our, our, our land when they were privatised and now want to increase water charges in order to continue making their vast profits. I am very clear that a, a Labour government will take into public ownership water, mail and rail. We will take into public ownership. <laughs> A 1940s or 50s style of public ownership, it will be much more about representation of the consumer, of the workers in the industry, of the trade unions and of local authorities so that we actually have a community and consumer base to the way in which our public services are run. More democratic and I believe it would make it very difficult, God forbid there should ever be another Tory government, coming in and trying to privatise them. We simply wouldn't allow it because we'd develop such support for the system we would bring in. That is what the Labour Party is about. I want to say this about our party. I've been in the Labour Party all my life. I've never been in anything else. I've only ever been in the Labour Party. It's had its ups, it's had its downs. We've had our great achievements. We've had some less great days. But at the end of the day, the Labour Party represents the aspiration, the collective optimism of ordinary people. That's how we got the National Health Service. That's how we got council housing. That's how we got much of the post-war planning legislation. That is how we got the Human Rights Act and the Equalities Act. That is how we achieved so much. Our rights don't come from above, they never did. Those that campaigned for the right to vote in the 19th century were successful and from that developed so much good. Factory legislation, health and safety and so many other things. Women got the right to vote, not because they waited for Lloyd George to give it to them, because they went out and demanded it. Yeah. And great figures in the West Midlands, like Mary MacArthur, did so much to inspire others. That is where our movement comes from, rooted absolutely in communities. I was elected to lead this party three years ago, and I'm very proud to lead our party. Very proud of the membership that we've attracted and very proud of the activity that there now is within the party. We hold these campaigning days 
and 400 events are organized in one day all across the country. That's not because the Daily Mail says there's a Labour event going on in Corby on Saturday, get along there. <laughs> and it's not because the Daily Express says that Labour's doing some really good stuff in, in Livingston in Scotland. No, it's nothing to do with that. It's about people getting out and talking to others. It's about community campaigning and community organising. And what we've done is set up community organising within the party. We've appointed a number of community organisers in order that the party works within the communities all the time. So we don't just knock on a door and say in a retail fashion, hello, I'm to Labour Party, are you going to vote for us? Uh, I don't know, okay, well that's doubtful, then move on. <laughs> you talk to them and say, okay, what's your concerns? What are the issues? Would you join us? Would you give us the benefit of your knowledge? Give us the benefit of your advice? What do you think should happen in this town? What do you think is going wrong in this town? What do you think is going right? In this town. It's about bringing people in. It's about that strength of communities. Redditch Labour fighting very hard to defend specialist facilities in their local hospital, knowing full well that down the road in Worcester it's very overcrowded and finding a, a great strain to deal with the patients they've got. <coughs> Same issues apply in many parts of the country. Labour campaigning can make a difference, can demand authorities do things differently. But it's also about raising the hopes of people of what we can achieve as a Labour government. How we can start to redistribute wealth and power. How we can have an intelligent trading relationship with Europe in the future and not the kind of dystopian fiction world of, uh, of Boris Johnson and Jacob Rees-Mogg. Oh, goodness, can you imagine those two running a government? Well, I'm, well unfortunately I can actually. It wouldn't last very long, but I can, I can imagine it. But it is up to us to mobilise people as to what can be achieved in the long run and in the short run and in the future. And that's what makes our party so different, so special and so strong. And in a society where inequality isn't just rich and poor inequality, it's also regional inequality and it's also ethnic inequality as well. Why is the disproportionate numbers of poor people in the black and minority ethnic communities compared to others? Why are the disproportionately high numbers of black youngsters in our criminal justice system, in our mental health system? Look at the causes of problems and look at the need for developing a society that is proud of its diversity, proud of its multiracial character, proud of its multi-ethnicity, and proud that when we work together, we achieve things. When UKIP come along, when the EDL come along, when the far right come along and start blaming a minority. It's a very handy thing to do. Blame a minority. Blame so and so. Your problems are all caused by migrant workers, all caused by refugees, all caused by always some other minority. At the end of that, you've created a sense of hatred towards that minority. You haven't actually employed a teacher, trained a nurse, built a house, or solved any problem whatsoever. All you've done is divided people. Look at it the other way around. When we're united, we're very, very strong. Very, very strong indeed. When we respect each other's values, we're very strong. When we say absolutely no to anti-Semitism, no to Islamophobia, no to racism in any form, we are stronger as a party, as a society, and as a community. <laughs> about those human values, that sense of justice that we want to develop within our society. That's what Labour is about. That's why we challenge the government on its social policies, on its economic policies, on its international policies and the whole strategy that they adopt. That's what's different about us. You're not going to hear a lot of this in the mainstream media newspapers. You might hear some bit on television, but it's very interesting during the general election campaign public perceptions of Labour changed dramatically as soon as the broadcasting rules kicked in and they had to give us equal time to the others during the election campaign. It suddenly all changed. Because people could hear what we see, what we were actually saying as a party. So, I want us to win here in Walsall, to win in Stoke, to win in Telford, to win in Redditch, to win in all the other marginal constituencies where we've 
uh, already adopted candidates. I've been to, I think, about 75 marginal constituencies in the past year, talking to people, listening to them, and doing that campaigning work. And everything that Jill said before I spoke at this meeting this afternoon shows just why she'll be an absolutely brilliant MP for Walsall. Yeah. Because of her life experience, she doesn't see getting elected to Parliament as a way of climbing up a ladder to kick it away that nobody else can achieve the same. She sees her role as your Member of Parliament to be there, to represent the constituency, to understand the people she's representing, and to say in Parliament and to the government the sanctions policy adopted with universal credit and, and social security is unfair and wrong and impoverishes people and leads them into debt and in some cases even to homelessness. The ending of the nurse bursary is a disaster for those that want to work in the National Health Service. The underfunding of the mental health services is a disaster with the mental health crisis that we've got. The lack of investment in infrastructure and industry is a disaster all across the West Midlands. What you need is a Labour government to do things very differently. She is a brilliant candidate and will be a brilliant MP. But she's not going to be elected because any of the media say she's wonderful. She's only going to be elected if we all go out and not just say to people, vote for Jill, she won't mind me saying this. It's about voting for our community, about voting for all of us, about voting for the next generation, as well as voting to protect those that need help and support now. That is what Labour offers. So I simply say this to the government, to Theresa May and anyone else. We've had eight years of your austerity. We've had eight years of falling wages, eight years of longer waiting lists, eight years of overcrowded schools, eight years of cuts and closures all over local government, all over the country, because of the cuts in local government expenditure. We've had the embarrassment, and it is a national disgrace and an embarrassment of um, Boris Johnson as Foreign Secretary. That was a terrible period. <laughs> History will record that as a totally terrible period. But we've also had a government that simply seems incapable of standing up for human rights and human values around the world. How come they're so quiet about the bombing of Yemen? How come they're so quiet about so many other things around the world? No. We can and we will do things differently. So I ask all of you, don't just come to events like this, fun as they are, crowded as they are, overheated as they are, everybody starts sweating and everybody starts throwing railways around. Go outside in the bright sunshine. Knock on doors and talk to people. Knock on doors. It's good for your heart, good for your soul, and good for the future of all of us. Go out there and do the campaigning. Go out there and get the support. Go out there and get the people involved so our membership gets even bigger. And contribute to the policy-making ideas. Every one of us knows something nobody else does know. Think about it. Let's learn from each other. That way we get stronger policies. That way we get a stronger election campaign. As I said outside, if Theresa May fancies a week walking holiday in Dolgastly, absolutely fine by me. Last time she called a general election. Bring it on. We're ready for it any time. Thank you very much.